There are some game shows that will give you a word or two and ask for you to identify what those words have in common. And we could play that game tonight, Monday night, Memphis School of Preaching Lectureship, and your words would be Dan Winkler. I could add to that, Monday night, Memphis School of Preaching Lectureship, capable exposition of the scriptures and application thereof. One thing I've always loved about hearing Brother Winkler is that he'll tell you the what, what does the text say, and then he'll tell you the so what, so what does that mean to you and to me? And that is what preaching is certainly all about. He's been doing that since 1969, so he's approaching uh, 50 years of preaching, a graduate of Oklahoma Christian, David Lipscomb University, secured degrees in Bible and New, New Testament studies. And for the past 12 years, he's been a faculty member at Freed Hardeman, authored several books, and the latest one is entitled Forgiven, Forgiving, and Free, The Peace of Living Without a Past. And he and his wife, Diane, of 43 years, have been blessed with three great sons and seven beautiful grandchildren. And uh, recently, travel schedules have kind of merged uh, so that we were able to spend some time together, more time together in a row than I've ever been able to spend with him and his sweet wife. And the more I've been around him, the more I've grown to love him. And I'm glad he's here tonight to help us love God even more. It's my privilege to present Brother Dan Winkler. Good evening. Good evening. Isn't it wonderful to be here tonight? Yeah. Oh, that singing. Stephen knows how to lead gospel singing. Amen? Yeah. And he can sing himself <laughs> tonight. <laughs> but after that blessed event that comes around here shortly, uh, he's going to listen to two others singing <laughs> early in the morning, I'm afraid to say. Twins, I can't believe. I remember reading some time ago about these fathers, prospective fathers that were all in the same waiting room while their wives were uh, in the delivery room back when daddies had to stay in the, in the, uh, the waiting room. And so the nurse, she came out and is Mr. So-and-so here. Yes, 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 that's me. And she said, Mr. So-and-so, your wife just gave birth to beautiful twins. He jumped up and down. He said, that is wonderful. What a coincidence. I work for the Twin Oats Printing Company. <laughs> a while later, another nurse came and said, is Mr. So-and-so here? Yes, 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 that's me. She said, Mr. So-and-so, your wife, believe it or not, just gave birth to a set of beautiful triplets. He said, that's amazing. And isn't it a coincidence? I work for 3M. <laughs> About that time, the third man in the room started to run out to said, hey, boy, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. What, what's going on with you? He said, I'm gone, boys. I work for 7-Up Company. <laughs> Be grateful for twins. My life, Diane's, BJ's, and Tish's have meshed a few times this year, and I have come to truly love BJ and Tish Clark. I love to hear BJ preach. He knows how to preach. He knows the Bible. He'll take you to the Bible, and he will homiletically open up the scriptures and invite it into your life. And I love the way he always will take you back to the Old Testament for examples of what he's learning from the New Testament. And just a wonderful, wonderful servant of the Lord. And I know you feel blessed to have him here directing the school of preaching. You are blessed to have a good preacher, great preacher, directing the school of preaching, great preachers teaching in the school of preaching, teaching men how to be great preachers. So it's always a delight to be here for this particular occasion. Monday nights, Memphis School of Preaching lectures 
have proven to be one of my favorite nights of the entire year, and you're the reason why. I get to look into familiar faces, receive wonderful bear hugs and embraces from individuals I've come to love through the years, open up the Word of God, and share thoughts with individuals that are interested in what God has to say for their lives and the lives of others. It's a joy to be here. Faith under fire. The sky must have been ablaze. And as you looked up, you saw bolts of fire from God's fury. What might have looked like meteorites, a flame, weapons of God's wrath thundering to the ground, not to destroy the earth, but to destroy a specific location. Twin cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. One family escaped. A daddy, a mama, and two twin or two adult daughters. But as they are leaving, one of the four does something she was told not to do. And why did Lot's wife turn into a pillar of salt? Why? She looked back. If we turn to the next book of the New Test the Old Testament, to Exodus, it was a group of people that had the ear of Moses. In Exodus chapter 16, verse 3, no, Moses was getting his ear full. As the Israelites began to murmur and bellyate, verse 3, the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord, listen to it, in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full. Exodus 17, verse 3, And the people thirsted there but for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt, out of Egypt, to kill us, our children, and our livestock with thirst? And as we turn to Psalms 95, God reflects back on these people, and he says in the English Standard Version, I loathed that generation. And why? Because they looked back. Do you remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verse 62? No man putting his shoulder to the plow, looking back, is fit for the kingdom. Do you remember what the Holy Spirit said through the Apostle Paul in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 22? Individuals who had once escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust were once again entangled in the same. And as a result, the Holy Spirit through Peter described them as a dog lapping up what came from his own stomach and a sow that has been cleaned and ready for the fair only to meander back and wallow in the muck and mire of its pit. And that because these people... They were thus described because these people looked and went back. All of that sets the stage for our assignment of the evening. As we turn to the book of 1 Peter, the cultural canvas on which 1 Peter has been placed is a group of Christians that were struggling to remain true to the Lord because they were suffering for their Christianity. And they were struggling to such an extent, they were apparently thinking about looking back and going back to the way it used to be and to the individuals with whom they used to be. By means of introduction, let's just put our finger on the pulse of the book that is receiving our attention for this week's lectures, the book of 1 Peter. 
Whenever we think about 1 Peter, let's ask three questions just by means of introduction. Who wrote the book? To whom was it written? And why? Well, who wrote the book? We don't have to read very far. In fact, you turn to the first chapter, to the first verse, and what's the first word? Peter. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Peter, ladies and gentlemen, is that unique individual that literally had four names. Simon, Simon Peter, Simeon, and Cephas. And as you study the apostles of Jesus, he almost always is the one, by virtue of priority, that is mentioned first. He took a great lead in the apostleship. As you're reading the book of Acts, the first half of that book basically directs our attention to the efforts, the leadership of, not Paul, but rather this great servant of God, the apostle Peter. He's the one that wrote the book of our study tonight and this week. Now, question number two. To whom was the book written? As we continue to read 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, we read, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion. To the pilgrims. Now, the word translated pilgrims is really, and the Greeks love to do this, they would take different words and put them together to paint a word picture with a specific meaning. And as you look at this word, there are literally three words that are put together to paint a word picture. There is the word for by the side, there's the word for over, and there's the word for people or occupants. And so we're reading about a people who were the people over by the side. These were individuals that were always the outsiders. They were not living at home. They were not homeboys. These were individuals who were living where they were living and they were viewed as the outsiders people. But it says they were the pilgrims of the dispersion. And the word for dispersion here carries the idea of individuals that were scattered. In point of fact, individuals that had been thoroughly scattered and that contextually because of their Christianity, their convictions, their faith. The passage says, pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And if you go to your map, study your geography, you will find yourself in what today we call Turkey. Individuals who no doubt, some of which, if not all of them, had been converted by the teachings of the apostles and preachings of the apostles in Palestine, perhaps even in southern Palestine, perhaps even in the city of Jerusalem and the areas about. But these individuals had been thoroughly scattered from southern Palestine all the way northward to what we call Turkey. They had to leave their home. They had to leave their family. They had to leave all of their belongings. They had to leave all of their friends and they were scattered thoroughly to a foreign land where they were thought of as the outsiders. And that because they had become Christians. It is believed that the book was written primarily to Jews, but also to individuals that had a Gentile background as well. Individuals that were suffering for their Christianity is the answer to question number two. To whom was First Peter written? But now question number three, why? It interests me to read First Peter and find the word suffer in some form no less than 17 times. Not only will you find the word suffer, you will find synonyms to the concept of suffering. Synonyms like grieved, trials, harm, threats, trouble, revile, over and over again. We're reading of individuals who are struggling from individuals without because of their Christianity. That's why I believe that we could turn to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16, for what I like to call the thesis 
statement of the book. If any man suffers, there's that word, as a Christian, they were, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this name. And you will find that silver thread woven all the way through the book of 1 Peter. Yes, we are suffering for Jesus' sake, but let's continue to suffer. And let's suffer in a way that we bring glory to our God. And so if you like to mark in your Bibles, outside the margin of 1 Peter 4, 16, write the word thesis. Or, if you wish, write the word theme. That's the theme of the book. You suffer, but glorify God anyway, and don't lose heart. Don't lose faith. Don't look and go back. How many do you know that have become sons and daughters of God, brothers and sisters in Jesus, but for one reason or another, they found it difficult to walk paths of righteousness. Maybe it's because when they were converted to Jesus, they left a family that was less than supportive, a family that began to withdraw from them, ignore them, write them off. And ere long, they just could not stand the isolation and went back. Perhaps there are individuals that have had a very difficult time overcoming a bad decision that they made in the past and the consequences of a bad decision. And everywhere they turn, the consequences of that bad decision seems to encapsulate every step. And they're constantly reminded of the person they used to be, even though the, by the grace of God they know they're forgiven, they just can't seem to forgive themselves. And sooner or later, they just give up and go back. Perhaps they're struggling with a habit that became theirs due to a bad decision. And they became a Christian thinking that that would help them not only with life, but in the abundant life, overcome the habit. And ere long, they find that the craving is just as hard to say no to as it was before, if not harder. And finally, they cave and they say, what's the use? And they go back. Perhaps they left a religion. And because of their leaving a particular religion, all of their friends back here are asking them, well, how do you find it over there? We miss you over here. And the peer pressure becomes so strong, sooner or later they go back. Those individuals are struggling with the same sentiment that the re initial recipients of 1 Peter struggled the temptation to go back. Now I'm going to make a statement and I want all of us to take it to heart. You, ladies and gentlemen, and I will either be moved by the world or we will move the world. You can't have both. Now, I'm reading of a group of people that are being encouraged to move the world. But they're being tempted to go back into the world. They are challenged to move the world as Christians. But they're being moved by the world. I want us to approach our assignment tonight and make personal application. I want us to not only see what 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 13 through the end of the chapter say, but I want us to see what it says to us and how it needs to be applied to us. And at one particular place in our lesson, what it says to us as preachers. and preachers' wives. As we turn to the book of 1 Peter, 
Actually, our assignment is verses 18 through 25, but the contextual flow takes us all the way back to verse 13. As we study these passages, we're going to attempt to do a few things. I want to direct our attention to four commands, three concepts, two constructs, and one awesome conclusion, all derived from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 25. And as we look at these four commands, three concepts, two constructs, and one awesome conclusion, we're going to be encouraged to be individuals who move the world rather than individuals moved by the world. Let's begin with four commands found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 25. We'll read the passage, and as we read, we will emphasize the command. As you read this context, there are four verbs that are found in something called the imperative. Now, if I were to say the house is on fire, it is imperative that we leave. What am I saying? It is necessary, it is essential that we leave because the house is on fire. And so when you're reading a verb in the imperative, you're reading about something that is essential, something that is necessary. You're reading a command. And there are four imperative verbs in the entire chapter of 1 Peter 1. And they're all found in this reading. Let's go. Verse 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope. Command number one, hope. Rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, going back as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also... Command number two, be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, again, a command connecting to the second command just mentioned, be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, command number three, conduct. Some translations say pass. Conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Conduct yourself with respect, respect for God. Knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but, by, but was manifested in these last times for you, who through him believed in God, who raised him from the dead, and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, command number four, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever, because all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man is the flower of grass, but the grass, the grass withers, the flower fa falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. This is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. From this reading, four imperatives, four commands. And I believe that as a Christian in the 21st century, if I will give my attention to obeying these four commands, they will help me live apart from the world. They will help me move the world rather than be moved by the world. They will help me keep from looking back and going back, but rather standing in front of others saying, follow my lead. Command number one, verse 13, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Literally, hope 
in the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The command is, be individuals who place your attention on something in the future. Now think about that in context. They were not to focus their attention on what they were experiencing and struggling through at present. They were not to focus their attention on the way it used to be in the past. The Holy Spirit said through Peter, no, get your attention on something that is ahead of us, hope. Place your finger on verse 13, and let me remind you, you find that elsewhere in this epistle. You go all the way back to chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a living what? Hope. What do you mean, Peter? Unto a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved where? In heaven for you. The hope that I'm reading about in context is a hope for something ahead, something that will be mine, yours in heaven. But when will that something come? Verse 13 says, rest your hope fully upon the grace, the favor that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That reminds me of what I read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. To you that are afflicted, rest with us at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven in flaming fire with the angels of his glory or power. It's talking about the second coming of Jesus. And it's called the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so our passage says, you are commanded to look ahead. You are commanded to focus your attention on the favor that is going to be brought to you when Jesus comes again. Hope. Do you remember Titus chapter 1 verse 2? It talks about the hope of eternal life which God who cannot lie promised before times eternal. Do you remember Titus chapter 2 verse 13 where we read about the blessed hope and appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ? The Bible is literally riddled with passages that tell us we need to focus our attention on something better than this life that will come after this life. That helps me stay focused and stay true. In the Tate Art Gallery of London, there's a painting of Frederick Watts. It depicts a young lady. She sits on a globe. Her head is bent. She's dejected in her features. She has in her hand a harp. All the strings of the harp are broken except for one. And that one last string is raveled to the breaking point itself, but still her head is bowed, her ear is turned as she plucks that one last string. And do you know the title of that painting? Hope. And the implication is this. We live in a world of difficulty, rejection, and feelings of dejection. But when all hope seems lost, there's still one last string that we can pluck. And here's a group of people that were struggling with the pressure of remaining true, wanting to go back to the past. And the Holy Spirit through Peter is saying, no, lean your ear to the string and listen and be soothed by its sweet music. And that sweet music is called, you're hoping for something better in the future. If you want to go back to the past, you need to start thinking about the future. Holding hands with Jesus, kneeling in the presence of God, studying the Bible with Paul, embracing your mom and your dad and your grandparents and your children that you've lost before you. You need to look ahead and it'll keep you from looking back. Hope is the command. Command number two, verse 15. As he who called you is holy, you 
also be holy. Hagios, separate. I find it of interest that the four living creatures say to God the Father, separate, separate, separate. Hagios, Hagios, Hagios. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. God the Father is holy. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of whom? The Holy Spirit. God the Spirit is holy. And what did Peter say about Jesus Christ on Solomon's porch in Acts 3, 19? You denied the holy and righteous one and asked that a murder be granted unto you. God the Father is holy. God the Spirit is holy. God the Son is holy. And as he who called you is separate, transcendent from the world, the Holy Spirit says through this epistle, you live separate from the world too. Be holy. I cannot look back. I cannot go back. I cannot embrace the way I used to be. I cannot be encapsulated by the ways of the world and be holy. I must obey command number two and live a life separate from the ways of the world. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable or spiritual service. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27, Jesus presents the church to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. As a member of God's holy people, I am to be a holy person. And let me remind you, that's not the only place in this epistle where I find that concept. For in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, I remember, I'm reminded that as a member of the church, I belong to an elect race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We are to be separate people and not people that try to put our feet in the world and out of the world at the same time. In Northern Europe, there's a little animal called the white ermine, and it takes great pride in its glistening white coat. Hunters have found that to be something they can take advantage of, and so they will look for the white ermine, and when they find it, they'll let it leave its nest or its den, and then they will take tar, and they will coat the entrance of the, tar, of the uh, den with tar. Then they'll set the dogs loose. And the dogs catch the scent of the ermine. And the ermine begins to outrun the dogs. And the ermine comes back to the den, but he sees that the entrance of the den has been tainted with tar. And instead of defiling his beautiful white coat, he will turn to the dogs and face the inevitable. Just like that white ermine. I must be determined not to soil my white coat, my white robe, a soul that has been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I must be determined to obey command number two, be holy. But that brings us to command number three, found in verse 17. If you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves through the time of your stay. Don't you love the way the Holy Spirit worded that? Through the time of your stay? You know, family comes over and they, they come over for a visit. And I, I don't know about you, but I, I've, I'll ask Diane, how long are they going to stay? <laughs> the time of your stay. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Conduct yourselves for the time of your stay here in fear. Now the verb is, the command is conduct. You're commanded to conduct or behave yourself this way. And then it's explained. 
conduct or behave yourself with fear, with respect. It reminds me of that beautiful passage in Ecclesiastes 12, 13. This is the end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear, respect God, and keep His commandments, for this is the whole of man. Or what Peter said to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, verse 35, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that fears or respects, he that fears him and works righteousness is acceptable unto him. We must be a people who respect God. Individuals were at McDonald's, older men of course, and they were debating over a cup of coffee what you would do if so and so and such and such came into the room one man said what would you do if Abraham Lincoln came in a man said I would stand in respect that man he's responsible for the Emancipation Proclamation 16th President of the United States one of the most popular of all of our leaders what would you do if George Washington came in I would stand in respect and I would put my hand over my heart and I would say the Pledge of Allegiance. He's the founder of our, of our country. He's the first president. What would you do if Jehovah God came through that front door? And they all looked at each other. They began to nod their heads. And then one of them said, yeah, we would all get on our knees and bow in deep respect. Don't fool yourself into thinking you would get on your knees in deep respect to God if you're not going to live your life separate from the world for His glory. We must obey command number three and see that our conduct brings glory to God. Remember the thesis statement. If any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this name. I read in Hebrews chapter 11, God was not ashamed to be called their God. Ladies and gentlemen, is God ever ashamed to be called your God? Because you've looked back. You've gone back. You're thinking of looking back, going back. You're letting the world move you. And you're not moving the world. Command number four is found in verse 22. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth of the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, command agapao, cognate noun, agape, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Of the words that the Greeks had for love, agapao or agape might best be defined as a love that desires what is best for the one that is loved. Take that back to the passage. I am commanded to desire what is best, are you listening? For you and you for me. We are commanded to love one another. Now, how can I obey that passage and with my influence encourage you to look back and go back and be moved by the world rather than move the world? If I want what's best for you, I'm going to conduct myself in a way that will encourage you to join with everyone else and make a mark that is positive on your generation rather than have a generation make its mark on you. Love. Though I and have not love, I am what? Nothing. Though I and have not love, it profits me what? Nothing. Memorize the Bible from cover to cover. Stand behind microphones and quote it until you're blue in the face and let people leave in awe of the fact that man knows his Bible. But if you don't love, you are nothing. And it profits you nothing before Jehovah God. And so I must be a person who 
loves. Four commands, if obeyed, that can help me move the world rather than be moved by the world. Three concepts are found in this reading. First of all, there's the concept of See if I get it, come back. There's the concept of sanctification. And I find that beginning in verse 13 and going through verse 15. The concept of sanctification. Being an individual set apart from the world. I only direct your attention to what we mentioned earlier when reference is made to conduct yourself here in fear, but conduct yourself here, verse 17, as you stay here. This is not where we live. We've been set apart. My daddy a long time ago helped me understand the concept of sanctification. He directed my attention back in his old King James Version to Exodus chapter 13, verse 2. Sanctify. Now, my new King James Version says consecrate. Sanctify to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb. But in the same chapter, Exodus 13, we read in verse 12, you shall set apart to the Lord all that open the womb, that is, every firstborn. Sanctify, verse 2, set apart, verse 12. To sanctify is to set apart. And that's what I'm reading in verses 13 through 17, a people that have been set apart from the world. We're just staying here. We are to be separate from the world Holy with our attention on something outside of this world. Do you remember what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with verse 9? Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were, past tense, not are, present tense, such were some of you. But you were washed, baptized. You were sanctified, set apart. You were justified. More on that in just a minute. Here was a group of individuals that had yielded their faith to the will of God. They had had their sins washed away, and in the process, they had been set apart by God as a people that belonged to Him. Take that to 1 Peter 2, verse 9. An elect race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for, a special people for, His special people, God's special people. Set apart, sanctified. I cannot go back and live the way I used to live and still think I'm a part of the sanctified, set-apart people. I can't live as a set-apart people as the people that are not the set-apart ones. I must constantly remember, I am different. I will be different. I don't belong to myself. I don't belong to this world. I belong to God who has set me apart as his own. That thought will keep me from going back and it'll help me move the world and not be moved by it. Concept number two, the concept of being justified. Knowing, verse 18, that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, but, verse 19, the precious blood of Christ. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That's what we sing. That's what I just read. But what does that mean? We could step into one philosophical circle after another. We could find theologians debating over concepts of redemption. 
I kind of like the way the Holy Spirit defined it. When he said in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, In him we have our redemption through his blood. Watch it. The forgiveness of our sins. Now, isn't that simple? I've been redeemed. What do you mean? I have been forgiven by what? Not by your knowledge of the Bible, though that's important. I've been redeemed by what? Not by the great Christians that I know, though that's important. I've been redeemed by what? By the congregation that I belong to. No, now that's important. I have been redeemed. I have been forgiven by the precious blood of Christ. You know what the Bible calls that? Just if I'd never sinned, forgiven. Being therefore justified by his blood, we, have, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Romans 5 verse 9. I must constantly remember, I'm forgiven. I've been forgiven of all of that. Why do I want to go back to that? I'm living as a man without a past. Why do I want to go back to the past? I am just if I'd never sinned. Why do I want to go back and sin? A concept that can help me move the world and not be moved by it. Concept number three, purified. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. Don't you dare, don't you dare, don't you dare let anybody make light of obedience in a debate over faith and works, grace and obedience. Obedience still has a place in the plan of God for men. I have been forgiven by the blood. I read that, didn't I? In verse 19. But I am forgiven when I'm obedient. Blood is the how. Obedience is the when. They have to go together. I have been purified. I have been cleansed. It reminds me of what we read in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus his Son literally keeps on cleansing us from all sin. All together now. <sighs> I'm clean. I've been cleansed and I'm clean. And as long as I'm walking in the light, I'm going to stay clean. Why do I want to go back and wallow with the hogs? Why do I want to go back and eat supper with the dog that is feasting on something that is not, doesn't it? I think you know where we're going with that. <laughs> that will help me keep from going back to my past. Move the world and not be moved by it. There are two constructs that I'd like for us to contemplate for a moment. This is where I'd like to take pause. This is a lectureship put on by a wonderful school of preaching where great men are taught preaching. And many of us have returned back to Memphis with, to our great memories here from places where we're spending our lives preaching. And so for the next few minutes, this isn't for you. For the next few minutes, this is for us. There are two constructs in this passage that we must constantly keep in mind as preachers if we're going to help people move the world and not be moved by the world to go back into it. Construct number one. In context, one basic thing educated these people. 
to the commands they were to obey and the concepts by which they were to be known. And that one basic thing that educated these people was the word of God. I direct your attention to verse 18. Knowing that you were redeemed, not this way, but this way through the blood. Knowing they had been educated. Now the Greeks had two basic words for know. One of them is ginosko. And it's one of these words that it's a, the idea of, of ongoing knowledge. A knowledge that you're constantly adding to. And it's, by the way, one that carries with it the implication of relationships as a result. The other word is ido or oida, and it's more of a completed knowledge. Okay, Stephen, two plus two. I don't know why I came up with the number two, but two plus two, what is that? Four. One plus one, what is that? Your headache. Twins. <laughs> you know what one plus one is, and you didn't even have to put it on a sheet of paper, right? You knew what two plus two was. You see, that's oida. That's a knowledge that's complete. You've had that knowledge in you a long time. And that's arithmetic. But if you were to get down to mathematics and you were to start thinking about theorems and apply theorems to chemistry and you, you work it all out, now you're beginning to see how things work and you want to work it here and you want to work it there and you, you learn here and you do a little bit more and you learn a little bit more and, and that's Ginosko. Of these two, when you come to 1 Peter chapter 1 verse, 9, verse 18, the word that is used is oida, a completed knowledge. I find that fascinating. And what the Holy Spirit is saying through Peter is, you know this stuff. You have known this stuff. You know that you're sanctified. You know that you're justified. You know that you're purified. You've known that. You know that you are this kind of person. And knowing you're this kind of person moves you to live as this kind of person. What gave them that knowledge? Where did they come up with that idea? Well, go back to verse 12. And don't you see in verse 12 where it says, You who have, we who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit. Drop down to verse 22. You purified your souls in obeying the truth sanctify them in thy word thy word is truth john 17 17 in this reading the word of god is called truth word of god word of the lord all caps the gospel and the milk of the word if you go to the next two verses constant attention is given to the word educating these people in reference to who they were and as a result, how they should live. Now as preachers. We wonder why our brethren are struggling so with life. In all too many cases, it's because they're not hearing enough about the word of life. I'm saying we are not to preach about the Bible. We're not even to preach Bible in that we get up and we read a Bible verse or we read a Bible chapter. And by the way, uh, we might th think about this. This is what that might mean. And, and this is what that might mean. And if you have any need today, we're here to help you as together we stand and sing. I'm saying we don't preach Bible, we don't preach about the Bible, we preach through the Bible, from the Bible, and we not only put people in the book, ladies and gentlemen, we put the book in people. And you will not do that, spending time on the golf course or in the back of a fishing boat. You will do that only by spending time in a study. You won't even do it spending time in an office. Where's your office? You shouldn't have an office. 
An office is for a bank president. An office is for an administrator. We say we don't call our preachers pastors and then we make them pastors. You need to have a study where you're in deep with the book of God. So you can put the book of God into people's lives. I am ready to preach the gospel, Paul said, to you also that are at Rome, Rome, Romans 1, verse 15. I must remember, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We're not teaching people how to live when we're not taking people to the Bible and putting the Bible into people. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction which is in righteousness, that the man of God might be complete, furnished completely unto every good work. The Bible is here to teach us what we are to believe. Doctrine. How we are to behave. Reproof. Correction. And what we are to be. Instruction in righteousness that we might be complete. What we believe. How we behave. What we're to be. That pretty much sizes up life, doesn't it? And that's why the Bible's here. We need to be getting back to preaching the Bible. Okay, I shouldn't have done it. But I'm going to do it. Does that make sense? This is one of those, I ought not do it. And when I get through doing it, I'll say to myself, I shouldn't have done it. But I'm going to do it. It amazes me how many times you see individuals preaching the Bible without a Bible. They may have a phone. They may have an iPad. And I understand, I do understand their needs for that. If I want brethren to open up God's Word... Wouldn't it be good for them to see God's word in my hand? Amen. Preach the Bible. And if you're not going to preach, I should say preach the Bible, put the Bible into people's lives and take people to the Bible. Gentlemen, If you're not willing to do that, quit trying. You're not an asset. You are a liability. Preach God's word. Help people see the what and the so what. Make the interpretation, make the application, make it live. Construct number two. As preachers, we need to realize one basic thing motivated these people to stay true rather than go back. And that one motivating factor is, of all things, love. Look at verse 22. You have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love. Now, I'll just look right over that if I don't dig deeply. The word translated in is that Greek preposition, ice, unto, in order to obtain. Now go back to the passage. You purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in order to obtain... Sincere love of the brethren. You know what that's saying? Here were individuals that were in the world. And they saw Christians over here loving each other. Philadelphion. Philea. Phileo. The love of a friend. Adelphos. Brother. Brethren loving each other as dear friends. That's the word translated. Love of the brethren. 
Folks were seeing Christians loving each other to that depth, being dear friends to each other, and that moved them to obey the word that came from the Holy Spirit. I read bulletin articles. I read those nasty things called blogs. They're not all that way, but there are some that are. There are cowards that hide behind the digital world. They won't put a name to it. Or they might put a name to it because they know very little can be done because they don't have to read what you put in response. There are individuals that pick up poison pens and ride in their yellow rags and they will... Am I making sense? Do you know what I'm talking about? And we sing, they will know we are Christians by our love. By our love. They will know we are Christians by our love. Nonsense. As gospel preachers, we need to remember the world will be moved when they see the love that we have as dear friends for one another. When we get behind pulpits and we're constantly telling folks what's wrong with the church, we have no right to ask, why can't we grow the church? When we get behind these microphones and we begin to get people's attention and tell them more about what this brother is saying, what that brother is saying, what this church is doing, what that church is doing, more than what the church of the New Testament did and more than what these men of the New Testament said. And we wonder why people aren't impressed with our spirit. These people were motivated by the love of friends they saw in fellow Christians. As preachers, I need to see that. And it goes on to say, the command, love one another. So people are watching and they're seeing us treat each other as friends or not. And they're seeing us respond to the command to want what is best for each other. The world is watching. Are they impressed? This individual lived in Nashville, Tennessee, a journalist. If I called his name, you would probably recognize it. One of my dear friends knew him well. He used his influence and power to constantly berate churches of Christ in the Nashville vicinity. And my friend visited with him and asked him, basically... Why do you hate the Church of Christ so? And this individual who's not a Christian wouldn't propose to be one, comes from a different religion, replied to my friend by saying, you people hate everybody. Didn't make that up. All too often perception is reality. Brethren, we must work harder to be known as people who love each other. Two constructs to consider as Christians. Love is a badge. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. John 13, 34, and 35. Love is a boundary in which we are to function. Love does no harm. Romans 13, verses 8 and 9. Love is a buffer. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, behave ye like men, be strong, conviction. Let all that you do be done in love, compassion. 1 Corinthians 16, 34. Yes, we are to stand with conviction, but we are to do it with compassion. All that we do is to be done with love. Love is a badge, love is a boundary, love is a buffer, and then also love is a bond. Above all things, put on love, which is the bond of completeness. We're raveling apart in places because the bond doesn't exist. The bond of perfection, the bond of love. One final conclusion. From our reading, I would suggest that we're saying this. Dare to be different or become indifferent as a Christian. 
we are to be different. Come you out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 17 and 18. And if we're not, we will become indifferent. I'm reminded of the church in Laodicea. I checked just this afternoon. And of course, they were told by Jesus, I wish that you were hot or cold, so because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out. But then this explanation is given by the Lord in verse 17. Because you say, watch the verb tenses, I am rich, literally, I'm constantly rich. I have become wealthy, more literally. I got rich, I got wealth back there, and the consequences of that wealth continue with me to this very day. And I continue to have need of nothing. They were saying, man, I'm I'm." Look at me, I'm constantly rich. Look at me, I never need anything. Why? Because way back yonder, I got wealth, and the consequences of that wealth remain with me today. Do you see what they did? They looked back. They went back. They lived the way they used to live, and as a result, it made them what? Indifferent. You're going to move the world, or you're going to be moved by the world. You're going to either be different and move the world, or you're going to be moved by the world and become indifferent. Preacher, preacher's wife. Preacher's son, preacher's daughter. Elder, deacon, elders, deacon's wives, elders, deacon's children. One and all, we must know we are to be different. Come what may. Sebaste, the Sebaste 40. They were members of the 12th Legion among the Roman soldiers. They were given the nickname the Legion of Lightning, the Thunderbolt 12. It was learned that among their ranks were 40 individuals that laid claim to a faith in Jesus. They were found out. They were ordered to strip to nothing and in the dead of winter walk out onto a frozen pond and remain there all night until they succumbed to exposure. All 40 yielded to the command, marched out without any clothes on to the top of the frozen pond and stayed there through the night, save one. One of the 40 caved, ran back to security and to warmth. As the legend or story goes, one of the guards watching was so impressed by the other 39 that remained true to their convictions about Jesus that he too claimed an allegiance to the Lord, removed his armor, removed his clothes, and marched out to the pond with the remaining 39. And when the sun began to shine the next morning, there were 40 corpses on the frozen pond because they claimed allegiance to Jesus without compromise. Are you among the 39 or are you the one? I want you to think about that. And if this, the Lord's invitation, needs to be yours, please make it so as we stand together and as we sing.